All right, guys, this is one of these episodes where you don't know what's going to happen. I don't even know what's going to happen. I'm all wound up about a number of things. First thing I want to tell you about is the shout out to the Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain Arts Top Festival. You want to go there, especially if Ken Parker is speaking. I want you not to ignore me, but at the end of the episode, I want you to check out the links up there, and I want you to finally watch the Ken Parker Evolution of the Arch Top Guitar. So we are going to be talking about a number of things today. One of them is my frustration with what I've been working on lately. Now, you know that if you're going to get an Arch Top Guitar especially an affordable one. Hey, I'm not playing turtle here. I'm just getting stuff that you, the viewer, want to see, or but you just don't know it yet. You know that if you buy arch tops, junky arch tops, this is in your future. Oh, neck removal. Neck removal. Yeah, so you can guarantee you that. But I have learned lately, stuff coming into my, my shed... I've been working on some stuff that somebody has passed along my way because they know I like structural stuff that no one else wants to deal with. And so I have actually had to work on flat tops and you know what that means to me. So I think what got me frustrated was this. Do you remember I built a neck pulling jig. That would be because arch tops need their necks pulled. I'm going to give you a link to it right up there, right about now. You'll be like, dude, I can't believe you told me how to do this. Well, here it is. Oh, I want to show you something. You see that tape on there? There's ferrules there or escutcheons that go on the tuners. This is a 1947 Martin flat top and if you take possession of somebody else's stuff and you lose one of those escutcheons it's a huge deal because it's like everybody that ever trips and falls on a sidewalk because of a ficus root was destined for the moscow ballet that's what they claim themselves did i just say that no i didn't erase 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 anyway these flat tops have been coming into my shed, they all have the same thing. It's kind of like the necks in an arch top. The bridges come off. So, bridge raises up. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about oil field rig up trucks. We're going to talk about cranes. We're going to talk about what a lousy design the bridges are on flat top guitars. Yeah, I said it. I said it. I think that there is a scam going on. It's been going on for hundreds of years since somebody decided to ignore the violin maker. What does a violin have? I've got one around here. We'll get into that. A violin has a tailpiece, a tall bridge, and a neck. I'm going to get into the mechanics of this, but... So, I work on arch tops. And the thing to remember about the arch tops you see coming through here... And the weird stuff I do to guitars, they're my guitars. I do whatever I want because they're my guitars. And when I'm done with them, I can throw them away. I can fire with them. Or somebody goes, oh my gosh, I have to have that guitar. So, the stuff I'm going to tell you about is my opinion. And so, don't find yourself in a spot where you're watching what I'm saying and then running out and working on somebody's Gibson or Martin or Fender or whatever the good guitars are. The good guitars, you know what I'm saying. And yeah, don't do that. Because if you don't know what you're doing, why think about this. I want you to think about this. Why, out of all the Lutherisms this is, is in the whole world, why does somebody come to you when you have never worked on a guitar in your life or you don't even know what the guitar model is they're bringing you, but they need you to work on it? Guess what? They may have been to somebody else and they're going, 
this is going to be $800 and you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing, but it's cool that I get to work on your guitar, even hold it. Don't find yourself there. Yeah, don't lose the escutcheons. Put tape on them. They're impossible to find. And again, if it's the original guitar, you just, I don't know, call your insurance company if you have any insurance. Anyway, so where was I? I was ranting. Do you know that it's National School Psychologist Week? Yeah, I need one. Remind me to tell you about how this whole deal with Tammy started. Let me give you a link to Margaret Garrett's explanation. of. There's a few gory details that I left out. But again, it's National School Psychologist Week. So, where was I? Oh, yeah. I made a neck removal jig. Does this look like it's a removing a neck? So I found out, yeah, the neck goes up here. But whatever's happening here, these guitars, the bridge pulls up every time. And when it does, it warps the body. So I figured out I can take my neck removal jig and put this thing clamped down because it's not like an arch top. It's flat. And I can put a few boards in and get out the steamer. And boom, I can flatten these things out with my neck removal jig. But while these things are sitting on a flat top, I cannot use my neck removal jigs. And if you saw how many arch tops I got sitting around, you would, number one, go, oh, my God. You would be like going to your own wife and going, you see, you see, he's got more than I do. He's worse. I'm a Go ahead, do that. I told you, Maury. I told you I'm lit up. Anyway, so I thought, you know what? Why don't I just make a jig that will use, and Fred, you know Fred? Yeah, you do. He calls it a flat press. So we're going to call it Fred's Flat Press. And I'm going to show you how to make a whatever flattening jig because I just got too freaked out one day and just said, I can't have this tied up all the way. So let's start there. Oh, this fret, uh, uh, this flat, Fred's flat press, you see it's got a, you see these guitars have a hole right here. And you see the fret press, or the neck removal jig has a place where the neck fits here. It's turned around here. So I thought if I'm going to make a fret or a press, a flat press, maybe I should make it to where it's also a neck removal jig. Now, I want you to remember, when I show you this thing, you cannot put it on an arch top because it's not meant for arch tops. You will crush the arch top. The only redeeming thing about an arch top is the arch. Think that one out. Anyway, I took this part right here, neck and sound hole, and used it for a pattern. And I combined it. I did the thing that you never do, the crime of nature. I combine that design with the back of, you know it, pumpkin. It's going to make sense to you pretty soon about why I called it pumpkin other than its body looked like a pumpkin. Anyway, I took this and I took that 1947 Martin and pinned them together and made this tracing on this piece of whiteboard, blackboard, yeah, buff doesn't happen. Where is it? This. This just doesn't happen. Uh-huh. Anyway. Um, blackboard one side, whiteboard the other. Now I want you to look here. Look, you see. Where's Chick Flick Teal Pointer? So I took the back of Pumpkin and traced it out right here and then I took the next section and the sound hole and put it here and drew these tabs on here these pick and eyes these horns whatever you want to call them and then I cut this out and I put it on some wood and then I put about fifty dollars into hardware 
and I am going to take you over to the bench and I'm going to show you this thing and I'm going to put a guitar in it so you can understand uh, what this thing is and and then you're going to hear the worst things you've ever heard that everybody was afraid to tell you you son have been kept in the dark that's right I'm going to shed some light on the design of an arch top and compare it to an oil field rig up truck and tell you bridges pop off of flat tops for a reason. And it's the opposite reason that necks come off of arch tops. Anyway, I'll get to that. I'm going to draw this out because guess what? I have a blackboard or a whiteboard, depending on whether I want to use dry erase markers or, oh man, I'm on fire. Chick flick teal chalk to tell you the forces and what causes these things to fail. If there's anybody that knows what failure is, it's me, partners. Now let's get to the bench. All right, I like to, I like to dream, yeah, right between the sound machine. Did you know that John K. of Steppenwolf was a political refugee, could not speak any English in school, and was legally blind. Did you know that? Yeah, check that out. Anyway, you'll remember before I showed you a pattern. Now I'm going to show you what I did with those cutouts and what it turned like after, okay? So here's the bottom. This was the arch top part, okay? Or arch bottom part. So, cut this out. Oh, yeah, it's got an awesome chick flick teal starburst. That's not a zebra. These are boards that you sit off the bottom because there are T nuts. Do you see these here? Right there? Yeah, that's threaded. Those are chick flick teal screws, a lot of chick flick teal. And while we got this here, this part right here also goes into a T-nut that is set in there with a Forstner bit. A lot of this is, again, what you will see in the episode about how to build a neck. There it is, pulling jig. And there's a link up there if you hover your mouse. Anyway, we cut that out. And we have these tabs. We centered up on the tabs and drilled a hole midway. You want to keep these scraparatus here away from the body because you'll scratch things up. And we built two of these. And then we took and cut the sound hole like so out of the top one. So what this allows you to do is a couple of things. You can put a guitar body in there as long as it's flat and you can adjust it now let's go to coveter's corner shall we I want to show you a pretty cool guitar look up Harmony H922 Harmony H922 you're gonna find out that it looks like this it's a 12 string this one has a a neck. This is out of the Sean Mann collection junk. But pay attention to this one because these were pretty common in the 50s and into the 60s. But nobody told you that this one is actually from the 40s. And you know who Lead Belly is? Well, he wanted one of these when he was relief, released from prison by the inf, in. Uh, of the Lomax people, but I want to show you here. Let's drop this down just a little bit. I don't want to, you know, cut the cameras because the production costs are so high. But I want you to look. Do you see right there? If I were to clamp this in here and put the heel of the guitar right underneath there, I can turn this up. You see that? Let me let me see what's going on here before we have a complete disaster. You see this? 
I can put that up to the heel. Of course, I'm going to put something in here like a piece of a pit guard a protector, a piece of a block of wood, one of them little kids ABC blocks with a hole drilled in it that I can set up here and turn this up. When I clamp this down, I can press this off. You've seen how that works. So this is going to work as a as a neck removal jig too so I can like double my productivity like the doublement twins let's not go there okay I'm a product of the 60s so I'm gonna go there we're gonna talk about um, Julie Newmar or Catwoman remember her uh -huh. Way out in the weeds now, right? Okay, let's get this back up here. All right, let's lock this down. There we go. So, the way this works is, let's say we have a bridge that's that's raised up here and it's pulling out of itself. And I, I'll have this back up here and explain this after I get all the charts done. Typically, they can raise up and start pulling like this, and so this will be raised up because it'll start to pull the body up. So you could put whatever you want. Notice that there is a mark for a bridge here, but there's no bridge pinholes. You know why? Because somebody used their brain. There was a tailpiece with this and a conventional bridge. And this, again, this is a 12 string. But here's how this thing works. You pick it up. You look at this and go, oh my gosh, that is the coolest thing ever. Tim Lohman did that low volts. Low volts. Played the coffee can, personal Jesus. Oh, look here. Cork paper abound. You set this on here like this. Oh, notice that was almost made for this. This is a big, big guitar. Anyway, I want you to pay attention here. This is all thread, piece of all thread, knob, threaded knob, wing nut. If they call you that, that's too bad, but this is what your name means. Fender washer, swamp cooler tubing. Why? Because I don't want this to hit the body here. Another wing nut, there, another fender washer, and I have a thread protector here. That, that thread protector, you really want to hold on to this. So, let me turn this a little bit here so you can see what's happening. Let's go to this one. This is slotted. You see that? This is not. There is a T-nut coming from the bottom down here. The reason it's coming from the bottom is because when I start pulling with thread, it's going to push up against and basically pull the T-nut into the wood. This is what a T-nut looks like. It's got a place for chick flick teal screws. You basically drill the hole, push this up in here, anchor it with the screws. But this is coming up from the bottom here. You see that? Now, the way I have this set up is... You want to maximize your efficiency so you're going to put can you see this if you can't see this you need to call me and tell me and then we can rewind the episode okay yeah that looks like you should be able to see it so this fender washer goes right there see the thread sticking out you see that piece you see this washer it goes up here this is slotted and slides in. This first one's really important. You get that lined up like this, and you just start turning this down. And what do you know? It drops right in there. Can you see that? Now I want to turn this. Oh, by the way, I Loctited the knob on top here. So I'm going to put my finger down here and get this to where I can feel the thread dropping into the base of the T-nut or
right there. You see that? Good. Wonderful. You're all wonderful students. I would say that even if you weren't. Anyway, we're going to put more than one on because they need to line up and don't tighten them up all the way. And watch what's going on with the guitar. So, you've seen that. Now we can do the Marilyn Wood speed reader version of this by just putting several of these on. And notice I built this slotted up here because that way it's easier to get them rolling. But again, you don't tighten them all up at once. When you get them fairly tight, you want to, again, come down to where the threads hit your hand at the bottom of the T-knot. That way you don't have a situation where they're pulling out like so. I'm going to put the other two on the back. And I prefer that you don't watch my back end while I'm working. So take a break. But not one so long that I have to retrain you. All right. Now I'm going to go around and make sure that everything is okay. Everything's level. And I'm going to take the lower wing nuts here and bottom them out. And then I'm going to take a look at what, what's happening here. And I can just take these nuts these wing nuts and run them down and get the guitar where I need it to be. Now, in the event I'm trying to steam a neck off and I want to pull this heel forward, I can just grab the guitar and work it forward like so. And I've got enough room here between here and I've got these protectors here to get that right over there and again I can use any number of things including something like this that I have a hole in the bottom of already that will fit over that and then I can just pull this up and get this lined up so this is very versatile for pulling necks or whatever and it sits on top of the workstation everything's good but as you can tell I can turn this down, get everything just right where nothing is wiggling around, and I can press this whole body so I can get this in here. I can put steam in here, put towels in here. You've seen me do that kind of stuff. In fact, I think I'll give you a little clip of what that would look like. You know what? I don't have a clip because this is the first time I showed you, and the only reason I'm filming this, right, filming this tonight is because, yeah, this is going to see Fred tomorrow morning but this thing's highly versatile the parts cost mm, with the all thread and everything in the wood you're gonna spend probably a hundred dollars by the time you're done these knobs are pricey you could go another route with those but this thing will make your guitar secure it clamps down it's adjustable um, the one thing you don't want to do with this is try to get selective and forget or put something in underneath here. Uh, like if you've got a spot where the bridge is up and you put a piece of wood there to try to accelerate it going down and you forget about it or you have a tool over here and you crank this down, you'll hear a miserable sound that you don't want to hear. But you are going to see this guitar again, 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 again. This is the Harmony H. 922 that is the 40s model of the 12 string that lead belly was playing rare guitar it's got a cracked headstock it's got all kinds of things i'm gonna do whatever i want because i own it okay now let's get to the science part of everything that caused me to build this and i don't know i'm not liking any flat tops any more than I did before, but yeah, come on guys. This is awesome. Yeah, it's still me, Ken. Now, you might ask yourself, what happened to the Ken we all know and love? No, I wouldn't carry it that far. If, if you feel that way, <laughs> I, want, I really need you to keep it to yourself. Anyway, this is the Ken that you might see at some lecture hall talking about how palm trees 
behave and win because I'm an arborist and I do write papers about those things. And I've kind of hinted along the way that if you're interested in that, number one, you have a boring life, and number two, you should send me a request for the materials. Now, I have had a sordid life um, in which I have, number one, tried to raise the camera angle so I don't look so short, but I have worked for loggers, I've worked on a railroad tie gang, I've worked in an iron foundry, I have worked in the oil fields, both on drilling rigs and dismantling and moving and reassembling drilling rigs, which took me to cranes, which took me to palm trees, which took me to whatever I'm trying to pretend to be today. But let's start off with one of my favorite things, an oil field rig up truck. Embed that in your brain because this is actually your guitar, especially if it is a flat top guitar that you're talking about. So let's get to the blackboard, whiteboard, whatever. I am tempted once I'm done with this lecture to see if there's a blackboard on the other side so we can make some guitar frame that I'm talking about. Let's move the camera closer so you can see the board, which you won't be able to do anyway, but let's see what this, oh, this thing moves. Yes, I need you to be able to picture this truck up here. Let's start off with some details about the truck. First, the wheelbases on these trucks are very large. So a wheelbase means that from this wheel here, to the center of that wheel, to the center of the back wheel, these are duals, this is single, this distance here is the wheelbase. So it's kind of like the, the length of your instrument from the bridge to whatever is holding the strings in place, okay? You could call that the bridge. So the nut and the bridge, okay? Now, these trucks are anywhere from 320 to over 400 inches in wheelbase. When you start measuring that out in feet, not cubits, I'm abandoning the metric system for the sake of uh, my Canadian friends, A, that work in the oil fields up in Red Deer, cultural capital world, all the way down to Anadarko, Clinton, Oklahoma, etc. So, there is a relationship between the length of the truck and the weight of the truck, which these trucks may weigh approaching 60,000 pounds just themselves with their rigging and all this that goes with it. Um, there is a direct rel relationship between the weight of the truck and what it will pick up and that weight, uh, the picking capacity of the truck varies widely uh, based on a number of other things, including the angle of hoist uh, as these poles drop back like this, you can pick up less. And at some point, if you try to exceed the picking capacity of the truck, the counterweight effect will be the truck's wheels raising up in the air. Now, when I was running these trucks, I was known to run around and purposely put the front of my truck six feet off the ground and show off and, and, and be loud and obnoxious. Um, anyway, let's try to stay on guitars here, shall we? So when you are driving these trucks down the road between drilling rig sites, you don't want the poles in the air because these poles are 30 some feet long. You'll take out 
wires and all that kind of thing. We didn't have Bluetooth everything when I was running these. I spent a good portion of the 1980s and my 20s in one of these trucks. Now, these poles here, let's get closer. These poles here will lay down here. This is called a headache rack. So the poles will lay down. There is a pivot block right there that pops up out of the bed of the truck. And a pin drops in called a kingpin. And you pull a trailer on. And the fifth wheel attachment that's usually on the truck is actually upside down on the trailer. So they're called flatbed rig up flat bag bed gin pole or oil field gin pole trucks. Now, there's a very large pulley right here. There is a large pulley here. There's a series of pulleys here. So the main winch truck winch is right here. There is another one under here and another one off to the side. The picking capacities of those winches follow that hierarchy. This is typically a Tulsa 80 or a Tulsa 100 winch, which relates to its capacity and pulling of tons or hoisting of tons. Now, the main winch that you use to pick up big things comes through a block right there, goes up through here and drops back down. And there's a big hook on the end of this. There's another winch line that comes from here sitting usually below uh, the main winch, and this is all in the headache rack, um, and it drops down and comes through a rolling tailboard, and then it also goes up through that pulley. This is a double pulley or two pulleys. By the way, the pulley on the bed is about this big, and it's about that thick to give you, and, and uh, I've seen winches, winch line of an inch and an eighth, on a, a Tulsa 100. Blocks are typically McKissick's or Crosby's or things like that. This is not the kind of stuff you buy at your local hardware store. Anyway, there's another winch down here that is attached to something that we call a pole razor. So there, there's channel iron here on the side of the bed. So the pole razors sit there. You can actually take these poles apart. They fold up on either side of the truck when you want to dismantle the truck and use it as a flatbed, meaning you're pulling stuff up on the roller and flatbedding the truck. So this, this truck is, it can either be used as a hoisting truck or uh, basically uh, moving stuff around as a flatbed because it's got the roller there. Anyway, that third little winch hooks up, assists you getting the poles up here. You slide them over, pin them together, put the blocks on them, etc. Now. Once you have the poles in the air, that third winch line starts at the winch, comes through a pulley up here and hooks into something else. Typically you three part that, meaning up, back, through another pulley and up. The more parts or the more times you run the line through a pulley, the better picking capacity or tolerance on the, the winch line per se. So you'll see cranes with what they call a bridle area where they're, they're letting stuff out to let the boom up and down and it weaves back and forth. So when you double and triple and quadruple your lines, it helps with your picking capacity. I think we could use a visual aid at this point. So I will show you, this is a block. This is a hook. Notice the safety latch on the hook. But the principle of multiple pulleys and lines running through them. So one line comes in, it's the same line, it loops around to another set of pulleys up here and then snubs off at the end. That is so eloquently displayed in the logo of my Patna friends at Dioco Crane, Las Vegas, Nevada, cultural capital world. Okay, this is the part where things are gonna get terrible. Remember wheelbase, remember again these trucks can be as long as an average semi-trailer of 40 feet. They will pick up a lot of stuff. And the hoisting capacity 
is directly proportional to how much weight you have up here because this is like a teeter-totter. The big heavy motor, all of the big headache rack, you're talking about tube steel, it's four inches thick up here. And you can literally lay these trucks over on their side and only break off the mirror. They are built tough. So anyway, all the weight is up here. You've got some weight here, of course. And the more your poles are standing straight up and down, kind of like a crane, the higher your boom angle is and the closer you are to the load, the more the truck will pick. The more you lay the poles back, the more you lose picking capacity. But you gain a lot when it comes to mobility. You don't want to be running around with your poles up and down because if they go the wrong way, they'll have ache on you and you don't want to be inside there. It happens anyway. So what does this have to do with the guitar? Well, let's forget that this is a rig up truck and a wheelbase. Let's just say your tuners up here are winches. And there's six winches where a rig up truck has three. Now, is there a relationship between the string size on a guitar and the winch line size on a rig up truck? Of course. You have your big heavy string on the bass side up here, and it's thick and it's heavy. It goes over a knot and comes back here and either drops right down or extends to a tailpiece that hooks off back here. But you have six, the equivalent of six winch lines running on the guitar. Isn't that a nice? To a tailpiece, a bridge, and whatever. This is directly proportional to this. Now, when you pull into a rig site, again, you're not going down the freeway with your poles in the air. They are head ached. Now, to raise those poles, you put slack in the number three winch, you let that out, and you pull on the number one winch. So if the poles are here, and you pull on the number one winch, they will rise up and be controlled by how much slack is in this winch line here. If this is tight, the poles will not want to go up and you have all kinds of tension going on. That tension ends up being manifest first in this block and then in this one. Now, the more or closer the poles are to the headache rack, the more acute the angle is, the more pressure on the block. So how can you relieve that? Well, instead of hooking this line into this tailboard here, there's a roller right here, that becomes important later. But if you hook this here and start to pull, they will tell you, you better be in the corner of your truck bunched up because this is the most critical point. When these things break off the headache rack or lay down onto the headache rack, if this is attached to here, there is a huge amount of pressure on this block. And if that block fails or the winch line fails, it will come through the back window of the rig up truck and it is deadly. You got a pulley this big or winch line this big coming at you like a snake, kind of like a rubber band was and people have been killed that way. So what they will tell you is you take your, the end of your line and you hook off to something out here that is heavy, then you run out away from it with your winch in neutral, you engage your number one winch, your big heavy winch, and you put the winch line that lets out slack on this and you simply engage the winch, let this one run in reverse, this one run in forward and tap your brakes and the poles will raise up and you adjust them where you want by putting the third winch, uh, stopping it from going up or down, and then you're good to go. But 
again, if your poles are on the headache rack and you don't take this winch line and go out and, get, and improve your angle of pull and lessen the tension, and you pull from here, it goes up to here, this block is going to want to come right through the back window. I've seen it happen. The guy. The guy looked like Mr. T with a starter kit of eighth in, inch and an eighth winch line. And that stuff will take your head off and the burrs on it will <laughs> cut you up. Anyway, he was fine. Um, we're not good to each other in the oil field. I don't think there's HR there. I opened up the door and said, hey, Mr. T, starter kit, you good? Anyway, let me erase this and we'll go on to the part about guitars. Okay, so we have the tuning machines on the guitar. There's six. We have the neck, which is comparable to the bed of the truck. Yeah, this is office chick flick teal pointer. So, tuning machines, winches, neck, bed of the truck, body of the guitar is here. Uh oh. Yeah, that's not an arch top that needs a neck reset, right? <laughs> There's a relationship between where. I've got different color stuff here. I'm awesome. Between this, strings, string height, and where you don't want your string height, if you want to play notes and do that kind of thing and not have to depend on... I always have blue slide with me. You know that. Come on. Anyway. So, we have... The nut right here. This neck slopes back this way, so these tuners, this is the first breakover point right here. There's tension there. Okay, now we get to a bridge. And in some cases, the lines extend to a tailpiece that floats kind of like this block does, it pivots. It adjusts, it has to give them different angles it is exposed to. Now, when the strings are tensioned up, in order for us to hear them, they have to go over the knot. We're not going to get an intonation. So while we're here, the intonation is, is set by octaves. So if your 12th fret is here, the distance between here and here and here and the bridge or saddle in a flat top needs to be the same. That way you have an octave up. So an A here is going to be the next A up here. You didn't need to know that, but now you do. You're welcome. So. What's the whole point of this? Well, the design of the arch top was we bring the string, which is, de this is desirable, because this is the equivalent of, what I'm about to tell you is the equivalent of the poles coming off the headache rack with your line out here, which relieves all the pressure and, and minimizes it as much as it can be so you're not hiding in the corner waiting for this block to come through the back window when you pull up off the tailboard. By now you should know what that, that means, it's on the test. Anyway, let's look at this in terms of a guitar. If I am a string and I come across here like this, the equivalent of that point on a floating bridge is this block. Okay. Now, what the trapeze tailpiece, they typically look like this and the strings come through like this and they are capable of moving both up and down. They can even rotate sideways. Let's get way out in the weeds here. 
a trapeze tailpiece, the way it's capable of spinning, is kind of like a palm frond. They're not called leaves. They have a petiole. This part attaches to the trunk. It goes up this way. Some of them have spines and phoenix palms. There's leaflets. They're typically, some of them are bipinnately compound. Some of them are not. But if you look at how these things behave in the wind, this cantilevered beam, anything that's attached at one end, like a rig up truck pole, sticking up in the air, a flag pole, a column, any of those things are cantilevered beams. So when a force hits these, in the palm front is the wind, this part can rotate here and here. The individual fronds can rotate here, here, here. In other words, there's all these areas of movement that are meant to disperse force and minimize it. A floating trapeze tailpiece on a palm tree. Wait a minute, that's not coming out. A floating tailpiece, trapeze tailpiece on a an arch top guitar or even a flat top guitar. I have an H922 Harmony that was, it's from the 40s and it's the same model of guitar that uh, Lead Belly wanted when he was relief, released from prison, but it has a bridge that actually can move around and a trapeze tailpiece. So what this trapeze tailpiece can do is it can move this way and this way in relation to pull on the strings. It can move up and down this way and this way. And most importantly, it can twist this way and this way to adjust to the heavy force that's coming over the guitar string, i.e. the winch line coming over this fixed bridge. So the amount of stress that is on the floating trapeze tailpiece is so much less than if the strings come over the bridge and in a very short section dive directly into down into the, the sound board or the top of the guitar which is very thin and there's some I think there's some science that goes with that that I'll draw out here in a second but again the equivalent of this and a rig up truck is trying to pull your poles up and hiding in the corner when you're hooked into the tailboard rather than relieving stress and pressure like you would hooking up out here. I'm a terrible artist, but let's, let's, let's try and draw out what that looks like. So, you have the guitar. You have, <laughs> isn't that sorry? Let's pretend it's a 1918 Gibson, it's an arch top, it's a L4 and it has an oval sound hole and la la la. So there's the neck and here comes the winch lines and you've got the trapeze over here. That trapeze is attached to the tail block. Do you notice that I call things sometimes my own words because I'm relating and I always have related in my brain guitars to rig up trucks. Tailboard, tailpiece. This is attached to a heavy piece of wood. Its counterpart is attached to a bridge plate that is slightly larger underneath the thickness, and we know the thickness of an acoustic guitar, the thinner it is, the better, the more it vibrates. And Ken Parker will tell you there's a proportional relationship, the cubed relationship between thickening a soundboard from four millimeters to eight. The resonance goes it, it, it kills the guitar, it dies, kind of like when you put F holes in the guitar. Anyway, look at his lecture, I'll give you a link if I can, right up there, right about now. Anyway, so think about this. Strings are coming to and across what's the equivalent of a bridge. 
right after that, you drop down into bridge pins, bridge pins that hold this bridge in place. So when you look at it like this, the strings come over this, drop down immediately. They're anchored by these pins and they are pulling up with huge force on the top of the guitar right here. So I think the idea is, I, don't, I know enough about this to be ignorant, but it would seem to me that somebody has done a calculation to say, if Young's model of elasticity is X, meaning how much wood stretches before it permanently deforms itself and cannot write itself deformation, deformation, two different words anyway. Elastic instability. A palm tree bends so much that it can't pull itself back upright. I have a paper about that. Ask me for an email. Anyway, when you are pulling directly up with all the force, a straight pull force, it is the equivalent of pulling up off the tailboard. And what ends up happening is, how many guitars do you see in a luthier shop that are in there for what? Yeah, the bridge is doing this. It is trying to pull itself up. Unlike a rig up truck, a guitar does not have the means to pop its front end off the ground when you're putting too much weight on this fulcrum point. Instead, the only thing it can do is rip itself loose from the body of the guitar. So that said, I think that there is an area calculation. Let's get rid of all this, which I don't understand. I can't understand, it makes no sense to me. But say your bridge shape is this. And then of course, whether you're Gibson or Martin, it's one way or the other. And um, if that piece is that size, it would seem to me that the bridge plate, there's a correlation in the design that says the bridge plate, in order for this line to be stressed by these strings right here, that this being attached to this with a thin wafer of something that's supposed to be audibly excitably or vibrationally excitable and the bridge part up here that there is something in the size of this bridge plate that offsets the massive pressure that has to occur right there in order for this sound board or top of the guitar to perform as expected uh, vibrationally. I'm way out of my league. I have no idea what I'm talking about here, but think about how much sense it makes. So when you pull this straight up over this point, that's the same as this point on the rig up truck, why is this not going to want to come through the back windshield or rip itself loose right there again. This does not have the ability when exceeded to pop its wheels off the ground and everything be okay as long as you don't exceed the uh, capacity of the main winch line that's making all this happen. So, in my mind, the idea that this would be a floating bridge and the strings would come over it and it would have a break point and then these would come back three, four, five, six to something back here that is pinned off to something away from the rig up truck relieving pressure that can rotate all different ways up and down sideways as well as rotationally on every different kind of level this design I love this design so it's no surprise to me that when people come into shops 
luthier shops, I swear the main thing, okay, there's people that want their guitars fine-tuned, they want frets and all the, all the minor details to be um, operational because they are fine guitar players. And I swear a four inch arch top, one of my kits with a license plate on it for a pit guard is not going to give these people what they need. So there's a lesson in this for, for the crowd. I, I don't know how many of you are concert guitar, whatever, pianists or whatever. So anyway, here's my takeaway on this. If you have a guitar that has bridge pins and the strings go through it and you don't want this to cut loose and pop up and pull up the neck, this is these guitars, I'm, or the, the soundboard, these guitars I'm showing you right now are bridge failures and I'm learning about how to fix them. But here's a takeaway, guys. Both on arch tops and to a larger extent, flat top guitars. If you are thinking that you can put a 60 string on a guitar that was built in the 1930s that was meant to have gut strings or nylon strings, and you're gonna put these big heavy winch lines and pretend that your little guitar is an oil field winch truck, do not be surprised when this happens. Consult with somebody and say, what kind of pull can I have on these strings before it creates an integrity problem for the soundboard or the top of my guitar and the bridge and all that kind of thing. Next, if you're working on people's guitars and they're here, oh, you, I, you can fix this and you can fix that, and, and they bring you the stuff, you're in a whole different league now. This is where luthiers come into the picture because they understand these cubed relationships and which way the grain needs to go. I have the advantage of being a tree guy. I, I, I'm pretty good enough to go to court about why trees fail, and a lot of that involves wood properties and those kind of things. And you're gonna see us do a little repair on a brace that was cut a certain way, and it's split, and there's a failure pattern that goes with it. But anyway, so I wanna say hi um, to the late Stephen Vogel. Um, I met with him one time at UNLV in the in a plant physiology laboratory and we were trying to figure out about how to calculate failure potentials on large uh, Mexican fan palms that typically line avenues in Southern California and we had a discussion about strain gauges and um, and this and that kind of thing. He came out with a book, he died several years ago, called um, of cat's paws and catapults. If you can find Stephen Vogel's work and you like listening to me go on about this kind of theoretical stuff, a couple things, Journal of Theoretical Biology, this is no joke, Journal of Theoretical Biology is where a lot of the wood property stuff comes out. And um, if you find Stephen Vogel's article on how um, tree leaf petioles rotate in the wind, you will learn a lot about how trapeze bridges work. In fact, I think I'll give you the link below. Now, let me get this out of here. Let me get back in my shed because, what? Oh yeah, this is federal prison government uh, purchase service. <laughs> yeah, you're right, okay. That's enough of this, back to the shed and let's close this out finally. Okay guys, how was that for a before and bear with me you gotta love it after ooh ah uh, clean one owner this thing does just about anything now here's what i will tell you when you're putting these jigs on and stuff don't be toting the guitar around by the neck and fling it around because guess what this stuff was not intended to be carrying around the weight of this jig plus all of itself and you're gonna carry something around and neck's gonna fall off and you're gonna then you're gonna try and blame me and you're gonna look stupider 
than you did before you started watching me and listening to my ilky, ilky advice. Anyway, guys, I have just told you through some loose extrapolation of oil field winch trucks and cranes and and violins and who knows what but takeaway on this straight pull against something creates a lot of localized stress so don't be surprised um, if something cuts loose I am still a proponent of the arch top design. It worked great for violins in the 1400s. It's still working great for arch tops now. So, that said, think about what I said. Believe it or not, yeah, there's nothing going on here. This crazy stuff just happened, so you don't need that stuff, kids. You really don't need that stuff. You'll end up here someday without that stuff it's just a matter of whether you're alive when you get there or not where did that come from anyway guys i like doing the structural stuff speaking of structural stuff we're going to be back on pumpkin pretty soon one of those arch tops it's all tore up from the floor up you see that you're going to see that again you will see this again so hey guys give me a like Thanks for watching. Um, I'm always putting stuff on the Instagram so you can see what I'm up to. Um, send me an email. There's an email at the end. I like hearing from you, especially if you have questions. I have enough stuff laying around here where if you have something that you don't know whether it'll work or not, and it's a structural issue with the body, let me know. Chances are I'm going to guinea pig something and fake my way through it till it looks like it turned out. See you soon.